uh, as you can uh, also realize from the title, there is a lot to unpack. So uh, let's get right into it. Uh, and the first thing I want to clarify is uh, the link between uh, metabolism and epigenetics. Uh, that are two topics uh, that uh, don't usually go really together. Uh, so to understand what's the link, I think we have to take a little step back and understand uh, what actually is cell metabolism. Uh, I think the textbook definition is something like uh, it's a, a network, a web of uh, uh, biochemical reactions uh, that are necessary for the maintenance of life. Uh, that I always thought uh, is a little vague uh, uh, definition. So, uh, and doesn't really allow you to, 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 to really grasp what cell metabolism ultimately is. So, uh, because we are among friends, uh, I decided to uh, tell you a little story uh, to, 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 to really illustrate what metabolism uh, ultimately is. So, uh, this is a footage from uh, an old animated series uh, that uh, used to air in Italy when I was a kid. Uh, the title sounds something like uh, Browsing the Human Body. And it tells a story of three uh, red blood cells that uh, navigated the human body. I think we can start so Linda, the footage. We That's the start of oh, the... Oh, uh, we raped off you. Okay, so ourselves we, as well, no. We can oh, make... <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so basically, these three blood cells oh, uh, navigate the human body and the journey, the old fellow, that is uh, that guy right there, uh, tells what different organs and tissues uh, do and how they work. In this episode, uh, you can see the nutrients uh, are uptaken by the cells uh, and travel within the cells. So you can see the, the uh, sorry, uh, you can see uh, now the footage restarts. But in any case, you can see the carbohydrates uh, that are that little, you know, this, this candy. You can see the, um, uh, the lipids, uh, the, uh, the, the yellowish creature. You can also see the protein things uh, that are, uh, you know, the, the check, right now, the, the check up uh, guy in the back, okay, so <laughs> there's no way I can play this footage, but in any case, uh, in this episode, uh, these nutrients enter the cell, uh, travel within the cell, and uh, ultimately reach the mitochondria. Uh, that, as you will see in a second, uh, is uh, represented in a very classical way as a, a big, powerful energy plant that burns um, nutrients. In this case, uh, these three guys uh, will be burned and burns also oxygen to produce uh, waste and, uh, and uh, ATP. Uh, in the form of energy. And uh, of course, this is an educational content for kids. It's a little simplistic, uh, but at the end of the day, it illustrates really well what the metabolism would do. Here is the energy plant. Uh, uh, what metabolism is, that is a source of uh, energy and biomass to support uh, cell growth and, uh, and, and function. And uh, uh, indeed, uh, products of uh, cell metabolism are uh, uh, really crucial components of the cellular architecture, are really uh, building blocks for every structure that, that is present in the cells, or they are uh, uh, energy equivalents that are necessary for the carrying of different functions. But as it turns out, in always in biology, things are not the simplest. And we demonstrated in recent years that the metabolites also influence signaling events. And this largely because several metabolites are cofactors or substrates for chromatin modeling enzymes. And their ability influence uh, chromatin architecture and gene expression down the line. One of these is uh, acetyl CoA, uh, that is metabolite uh, that I uh, believe is truly interesting. If you go back to this uh, really intricate uh, metabolic web, uh, you can uh, see that acetyl CoA is positioned uh, really at the center of, of, of the map. It's right there because it is at the crossroads 
code between many anabolic and catabolic pathways. So if we take a deeper look at the acetyl-CoA, we realize that it is uh, present both in the mitochondria, which is part of the uh, TCA side, the, the Krebs cycle. And it's also present in the nucleocytoplasmic compartment, uh, where it's uh, the building block for the synthesis of, of, of lipids, among other things. But what makes acetyl-CoA truly interesting is the fact that it's also the sole acetyl donor for every single acetylation reaction in the cells, including histone acetylation. And we found that, that uh, its level dictate the levels of, uh, well, are in equilibrium with the levels of histone acetylation. So simply put, the more acetyl-CoA you have in the cells, so the more acetylated are the, the histones. Uh, acetyl nucleocytoplasmic acetyl CoA is produced by at least two different enzymes, uh, ACLY, that uh, breaks down TCA derived citrate uh, into acetyl CoA, and ACSS2 that synthesizes uh, acetyl CoA from. From, from acetate. In most conditions, uh, the role of ACLY is predominant, although there are conditions of such as hypoxia or tumors in which the role of ACSS2 becomes more significant. You can probably appreciate uh, this in uh, this plot. Uh, you can see the several histone acetyl marks are reduced in ACLY deficient. Maps. Uh, we demonstrated these in uh, several different contexts, and that's also been shown by uh, many, many other groups over the past five, uh, five years. Um, and although this was important. To be sure, no, it's probably not shocking because uh, targeting ACLY, you really mess with the ability to produce a acetyl donor. What was more interesting for us in the Welland laboratory was the fact that uh, acetyl-CoA levels actually fluctuate in real life situations and are actually sensitive uh, to a number of cell intrinsic and extrinsic uh, cues. Um, well, we don't really need to go over everything we showed, but I think it's still important to uh, to make a point of how dynamic acetyl CoA levels are and how impactful this is for gene expression. So, uh, manipulations of two essential carbon sources have direct consequences for um, uh, acetyl CoA uh, abundance in the cells, uh, glucose and, and, and acetate. Uh, here, we uh, cultured. Uh, it's a very simple experiment. We cultured the uh, glioblastoma cells in this case uh, in the presence of high or low glucose conditions, and we then measured acetyl CoA uh, directly by mass spectrometry. And uh, we showed that, that acetyl CoA levels really drop when glucose is limiting the medium, and they go back up when we add supraphysiological doses of acetate. That again is a, is a source of acetyl CoA alternative to glucose. And uh, importantly, these uh, fluctuations go side by side with changes in global levels of histone acetylation. So again, when acetyl-CoA levels are high, histone acetylation levels are high. And when uh, acetyl-CoA levels are low, uh, histone uh, acetylation is, is reduced. And these are consequences for gene expression, as we see uh, by RNA-seq in this context. And uh, But uh, this can be really applied to many different uh, cancer cells. Um, one can also argue that, you know, multicellular organisms have evolved a number of mechanisms to preserve nutrient homostasis. So, so what's the significance for these mechanisms mechanism in vivo? Uh, well, we did demonstrate that, that, that actually what we eat, our diet, uh, does impact uh, acetyl CoA levels uh, in tissues. Uh, I personally worked on a couple of different diets uh, in my, during my time in the World Laboratory. Today I want to talk a little bit about the role of fructose for a couple of different reasons. So one, the intake of fructose has increased dramatically over the past decades and is linked to the pandemic obesity, to the uh, obesity pandemic. Um, the other is that uh, fructose actually contributes to the acetyl CoA pool to at least two different mechanisms. So fructolysis feeds uh, glycolysis uh, directly uh, contributing to the uh, to uh, acetyl CoA generation. 
uh, on the other side, fructose is metabolized by the gut by microbiome into acetate that enters the portal circulation and again to acetate through the, 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 the activity of ACSS2 contributes to acetylcholine. So we did demonstrate that uh, fructose feeding elevates acetyl-CoA levels in the liver, and these as consequences uh, for histone acetylation at a number of different genes. Here we focus on the lipogenic genes, but we, you know, we are excited to, uh, to look at the more uh, genome-wide uh, regulation of the epigenome. Um, so, all this to tell that uh, acetyl-CoA levels fluctuate all the time uh, and dictated the epigenome. Uh, as a lab, we are really trying to understand how this links environmental inputs with sulfate decisions in different contexts. And uh, today I actually want to uh, show you a couple of examples, um, uh, even outside my little comfort zone uh, and we recently started uh, a project uh, looking at the b cell specification and okay i'm not an immunologist so i i hope i won't say anything shameful about you know b cell maturation is a multi-step process and one key step is the germinal central reaction so that as far as uh, as understand, uh, simply put, uh, can be described as the expansion of the B cell clones uh, that um, are able to react with the following antigen. And these germinal cell reactions involve the number of signaling events uh, and uh, involves a, a really extensive epigenetic remodeling. We also anticipated that the metabolism may play some type of role, but these have been surprisingly uh, not investigated. Um, so we decided to take a look at what happens at the acetyl CoA metabolism. And uh, we activated uh, naive uh, B cells in vitro. Uh, we tried a number of different stimuli, and this uh, pretty rough stimulation that we use, you know, LPL, L LPS and uh, IL-4. And what we saw is that uh, there is uh, a slight upper regulation of ACL1, it's not always the case, uh, but what we see is, is a really an hyperphosphorylation of uh, the acetyl-CoA producing enzyme, phosphorylation of saying 455, uh, augments its activity of about you know, six folds, and this correlates uh, with a, a marked increase in histone acetylation. We also saw that uh, in, uh, in, in vivo, these are mice, uh, in, these are immunized mice, and you can probably appreciate here uh, spleen follicular, and what seems to be bona fide uh, germinal centers uh, are, uh, well, Express ACLY, even if the images are a little blunted, but definitely uh, uh, showed uh, phosphorylation for ACLY, and um, cells appear to be uh, hyperacetylated. So we to understand uh, what's the role of uh, histone acetylation in uh, germinal center B cells. So we you know, mined publicly available databases, and uh, we. Well, we found that germinal cell B cells are indeed uh, highly acetylated, and acetylation occurs preferentially at genes that are involved in um, cell cycle reentry and and cell proliferation. So we came up with, uh, well, of course, we don't know yet if this any dependent on uh, acetyl CoA availability and acetyl CoA metabolism, but it's something that we are excited uh, to take a, a deeper look at. Uh, and that the model we came up with uh, is that the ACLY in this context is able to integrate uh, both signaling and nutrient skews uh, into the epigenome uh, to facilitate uh, B cell proliferation at the cell germinal center. Um, well, um, Again, uh, this, um, well, at this point, is more side project in the lab, but I wanted to pitch uh, essentially to have feedback from uh, people that may uh, know more than what I do about uh, immunology. 
but ultimately my lab is a, a, a cancer biology lab and we are really interested in how acetyl CoA fluctuations impact uh, the onset and the progression of, of cancer. And the reason why we believe that, that this is uh, an ideal uh, framework is the fact that, uh, you know, uh, acetyl CoA is, is is a sort of molecular sensor that is able to integrate a different stimuli from the um, micro from the environment and integrate those into uh, protein trans translational modifications, uh, in particular into the epigenome. And uh, this is uh, a perfect situation for an oncogene to exploit because uh, what an oncogene wants to do is to make the cells a sense of travel environment where there is actually not. And uh, we already know that oncogene already acts uh, at the level of a nutrient uptake at ma um, many levels in the nutrient uptake. Uh, we, uh, our hypothesis is that uh, it does that to impact uh, acetyl-CoA uh, levels uh, to promote uh, eastern acetylation and uh, force uh, cell proliferation even in uh, nutrient depleted conditions. Well, uh, uh, we worked quite a bit on that uh, during my time in, in Philadelphia. Uh, uh, particularly, we took a really deep look at the, the role of AKT um, in, the, in the cell metabolism paper. Um, to, but today, what I really want to focus is on my work on, uh, on pancreatic cancer. Um, for a number of reasons, pancreatic cancer is actually uh, a deadly disease. It's projected to become the second leading cause of cancer-related death by 2030 and probably much earlier than that. And uh, the reason why that is happening is uh, summarized in, uh, in, uh, in this uh, graph, where the, the most common forms of, uh, of cancer are uh, listed and uh, according to the uh, overall survival. Uh, and uh, so, uh, uh, for example, here you can see at the top of the list that the secular cancers uh, had a very good prognosis, uh, five-year survival, already uh, in the, in, the, in the early 70s, and the progress uh, that has been made uh, over the past you know, 50 years uh, uh, made uh, this type of cancer almost curable. 100% uh, of the cases, it's, 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 uh, uh, they're still alive after five years. But if you look at pancreatic cancer, uh, it uh, was already that last in the list uh, back in the days. And the progress that has been made uh, to really make uh, this uh, disease more clinically manageable has been neg neg negligible. So there is a lot of room for research. Uh, and uh, despite that, uh, we do know that um, pancreatic cancer has a, a, a almost universal association with activating uh, mutation, uh, KRAS mutations. So KRAS is mutated uh, in almost every single um, patient, more than 95%. And uh, so this has led to the hypothesis that like, uh, oncogenic KRAS may be the driver for this disease. And indeed, the mice that express the oncogenic form of KRAS in um, uh, the pancreatic epithelium spontaneously develop a form of disease that is very close to the human disease, uh, both in terms of histological features and in terms of progression. Uh, so these mice uh, first develop uh, metaplastic uh, and then dysplastic lesions uh, within a few weeks. And uh, these preneoplastic lesions eventually uh, evolve to become overt carcinoma uh, in a matter of, of a, a couple of months, uh, and they die uh, soon after that. Um, in this model, uh, we uh, add uh, a look very 
early on in my postdoc, what happens at histone acetylation. And we saw that the histone acetylation, both for H4, histone H4, and for histone H3, is really sustained throughout the different stages of the disease. But what was interesting was the fact that, that uh, histone acetylation was already elevated uh, at very, uh, in very young animals that have not developed the disease yet. And uh, you can probably appreciate better in this slide the difference with the wild type situation. So these are wild type mice, well, uh, stay, so these are pancreas of wild type animals, stained for uh, tetracetyl H4, that is a, a form of histone H4 that is heavily acetylated on all four lysines of the histone tail. Uh, so you can definitely detect regions of that, I mean, structures that are acetylated, like the ducts and the, the, the mm, the lung, the lung and silence. Uh, but most of the parenchyma stays negative. Whereas in KRAS, expressing any animals, uh, now most of the cells are positive for the acetylated distance. And uh, this elevation in instant acetylation seems to be relatively specific uh, for the subset of cells uh, in the parenchyma that are the acinal cells. So, uh, to, 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 to understand whether these have anything to do with acetyl CoA metabolism, we decided to isolate acinal cells from uh, mice uh, and measure acetyl CoA uh, levels. And we found that um, acinal cells expressing uh, the mutant form of KRAS had elevated the levels of acetyl CoA. So at this point, we knew that the KRAS mutations were able to alter acetyl CoA metabolism in a way that, uh, you know, uh, well, we was able to alter acetyl CoA ability. Uh, how the, is that in, um, impacting the, the tumorigenic process? Uh, acetyl cells are very interesting uh, cell type in this context because uh, you know, there might be some type of boring cells, they are very post-mitotic cells, very specialized. They basically are responsible for the production of digestive enzymes in the, in the, in the pancreas. Uh, but uh, when KRAS is mutated, uh, these cells somehow undergo a differentiation process and they eventually acquire a more data-like phenotype. This is nothing more than a metaplastic process, uh, also occurs in physiology, for example, uh, during uh, tissue repair after pancreatic injury. And it's usually reversible. It takes the name of asana to data metaplasia. But when k is mutated, uh, this makes uh, this process uh, more irreversible. These cells start to proliferate, expand, and eventually give rise to pinoplastic lesions. So that eventually evolved uh, to, to, to to carcinoma. So in this sense, uh, the actor to data metaplasia with ADM uh, can be seen as uh, the initiating step in pancreatic carcinogens. This. And luckily for us, uh, there is, um, I mean, these can be modeled in ex vivo. Uh, so these are KRS expressing acinal cells as soon as you see them in a 3D matrix. So you can recognize uh, the you know, classic grape like uh, organization. But only after a couple of days in cultures, uh, they completely lose uh, this acinal morphology and uh, they acquire a more data like uh, look. Uh, they even start to express uh, data specific markers uh, like cytokeratin 19. So uh, we looked at what happens uh, during ex vivo ADM, uh, and we realized that this immunofluorescent staining uh, there is an increase, a timely, timely increase in histone acetylation that peaks at 24 hours. And uh, to really understand whether this elevation in histone acetylation was critical for uh, this change in cellular identity, we decided to treat the cells with a uh, JK1, that is a bromodomain 
inhibitor. So what it does is to, to block the reading of acetylated um, lysines. Um, so this is a situation in uh, yeah, uh, DMSO treated uh, acid cells after five days in, in collagen. Uh, you can see that the plate is now full of ductal-like structures. But when the cells are treated with JQ1, uh, they are they basically preserve their arsenal morphology. And to understand whether this was due to um, acetyl CoA production, we, we, we first tried to use some ACI inhibitors, but uh, they are historically very bad and uh, they didn't work, to be honest. What we did was to uh, use uh, a, a compound that's called BTA that blocks the export of C2 from the mitochondria, thus uh, limiting basically the, the, the the activity of a CLY for the lack of substrate. And again, treated the cells with BTA, we were able to inhibit ADM actually. So at this point, we were able to uh, you know, demonstrate that histone acetylation facilitate uh, acina to data metaplasia ex vivo to really understand whether this was uh, sensitive to acetyl-CoA generation, we decided to do the genetic experiment. So we generated the conditional ACRY knockout uh, animals that lacked ACRY, specifically in the pancreatic epithelium. Uh, these mice are uh, fine, they don't have any overt uh, systemic or histological anormalities. Um, and uh, we um, so we moved on and we uh, crossed them with curious expressing animals. And as you can see, uh, ACI white proficient animals developed the number of, of uh, uh, pineoplastic lesions. So these are mice um, sacrificed at four months of age. Uh, the absence of ACI white really decreased the number of tumors of pineoplastic lesions that form in this four month span. <laughs> And when we looked at the status of histone acetylation, we uh, found that the absence of ACY really wipes off uh, the histone acetylation, specifically in acinal cells. Uh, ductal cells are able to, to, to still sustain high levels of histone acetylation throughout the means. So, uh, well, uh, we have more in the story, but basically, uh, I hope I, I showed you today that we demonstrated that KUAS mutations are able to impact acetyl CoA availability uh, in pancreatic acinal cells uh, to boost histone acetylation and then facilitate uh, this change in cellular identity that is the initiating step for pancreatic acinogenesis. Um, I didn't mention that we did report other several other KRAS dependent disturbances in, in this in this model, including uh, that the excess of ACL of acetyl CoA also feeds uh, the de novo cholesterol synthesis so that also play a crucial role in in in, in ADM and. <laughs> Is still something that uh, we are working on in my lab at BIM. Uh, but the core business of the lab is really trying to understand how um, the activity of ACRY impacts sulfate decisions, uh, in particular uh, ADM in, in cancer. And uh, I think that there is, uh, you know, a lot of meat left in the bone. Uh, in particular, we never really elucidated how. Mm, Acetyl CoA gets elevated in the first place. So, what really causes this uh, uh, elevation in acetyl CoA in nucleocytoplasmic acetyl CoA? And uh, we do believe that there are the KRAS induces some type of alterations in mitochondrial metabolism that forces the export of, of citrate. On the other side, uh, we never really defined what are the uh, regions of the, 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 the chromatin that are really sensitive to acetyl CoA fluctuations uh, and are important for pancreatic carcinogenesis and in, to what extent that those may be uh, manipulated uh, by you know metabolic uh, targeting or, 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 or diet interventions. 
So uh, we did start, um, well, uh, those are two questions that I uh, tried to address uh, right off the bat when I started my lab. And so we did look at uh, what happens to uh, mitochondria metabolism uh, uh, when KRAS is mutated. To do that, we used uh, a mouse model in which K oncogenic KRAS can be activated uh, timely by the injection of tamoxifen, specifically in acinal cells. Um, and in this model, uh, we, so uh, higher resolution was spirometry, uh, uh, we, um, we saw that, you know, uh, mitochondrial metabolism is definitely not impaired. Uh, if anything, uh, it's, 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 it's improved. Uh, in particular, there is a very significant increase in uh, the uh, spur of respiratory capacity. And this aligns well with the number of, of pre previous reports. Uh, and really, in our uh, quest for, to, to understand uh, to, uh, what happens to, 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 you know, to, to mitochondria when KRAS is mutated, uh, we looked at a number of uh, morpho morphological and uh, functional parameters. Uh, I don't need to go uh, through everything that we did. Uh, long story short, not much is changing, but uh, this very remarkable tightening of uh, the mitochondria crystal. Uh, and uh, so, I mean, you, you may be more familiar with what a crystal is. Uh, I was actually not only a few months ago. So uh, a quick reminder, uh, mitochondria crystal are uh, invaginations of the inner mitochondrial membrane that uh, occupy uh, the mitochondrial matrix and actually allocate uh, the, the respiratory complexes. And generally speaking, uh, the tighter the crystal are, the more uh, efficient is uh, mitochondrial respiration. So this goes well with our uh, previous data. And uh, what's interesting is that this is also compatible uh, with upper regulation of a protein called Optica uh, protein 1. Uh, what this protein is, is basically a molecular staple that uh, keeps the, 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 the crystal tight and also uh, induces the biogenesis of, of a new crystal. And indeed, uh, when we transfect the, uh, what these are two C3 cells uh, with uh, a, a, a mutant KRAS, uh, we did see that TOPA1 is specifically upper-regulated uh, upper uh, across a number of mitochondrial proteins. Uh, and uh, I was lucky enough to work uh, next door with uh, uh, one of the world most renowned mitochondriologists, uh, Dr. Lucas Corano, that had developed uh, a few years back a, a mouse model in which OPAS one is uh, slightly uh, upper regulated in the whole body. So we're talking about a 20-25% of, of uh, uh, upper regulation at the protein level. Uh, and these correlate uh, with improved uh, mitochondria and uh, motor functions in, in, the, in the mouse. But of course, nobody had really never cared to look at what happens at the epigenome. So I was really happy to, 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 to do to to do that for them. And when we isolated the arsenal cells from, uh, from uh, these mice, we realized that uh, OPA1 elevation uh, correlates with uh, an increase in uh, global levels of histone acetylation. Uh, these are uh, uh, cells isolated ex vivo, but we saw that also in vivo, uh, these are pancreatic tissue slides stained for, uh, again, tetracetyl H4, and we saw that OPA1 uh, um, upper regulation leads to uh, also increase in um, widespread increase in insulin acetylation in the pancreatic parenchyma, especially, uh, well, it's, 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 a, it's a scattered effect, but in any case, there are cells that are even more uh, susceptible to OPA1 upper regulation. <laughs> Of course, um, we have still many questions to address. Uh, of course, uh, how OPA1 exactly wires uh, the epigenome and uh, whether it is ultimately dependent on uh, acetyl-CoA um, abundance. 
and we're working on that. Uh, at uh, also, we are uh, trying to understand whether OPA1 uh, genetics may impact uh, the tumor formation in vivo. And uh, I hope I can show you data in the next, uh, in the near future. On the other side, uh, we're really interested in uh, what happens to the, uh, the level of uh, the, the P genome. Uh, and uh, that is a trickier uh, question to address. Uh, the, the, we decided to do that in collaboration uh, with uh, Rich Chandavani uh, at, uh, at Cornell in New York. Uh, he pipelined a very elegant system in which he is, he is able to trace Asina cells uh, undergoing uh, um, Asina to data metaplasia in vivo uh, upon the injection of a cholecystokinin uh, analog. Uh, he is able to fax sort um, cells undergoing ADM and to perform a number of epigenomic profiling. Uh, we don't need to go into details at all. Uh, but in any case, we are layering uh, ACI. Well, we initially thought to layer in ACI in this system. Uh, now we are you know, uh, considering moving towards uh, manipulation of, of, of OPA in the same system. Uh, we already have you know, uh, some data showing that uh, oncogenic ERAS mutation are synergistic with uh, inflammatory inputs. Uh, and what they, they do is to open up uh, the chromatin, these are uh, uh, attack seek data, the attack seek map of basically chromatin accessibility. Uh, and you can really see that the oncogenic and inflammatory stimulus stimuli cooperate to really open up uh, the chromatin at a number of different loci. And uh, we are really excited to understand whether these are uh, dependent on metabolic inputs. So with that said, I really want to thank my small, uh, fun and uh, growing lab. Uh, and you may recognize Marco, that used to be uh, in, in the, the Sun Lab, and uh, my funding and my uh, great collaborators in Italy and around the world. And uh, I thank you, uh, you all, both here and uh, in the room and, uh, and online. And, uh, Happy to take any questions.